Good Tuesday morning. Welcome to Squawk Alley. I'm Carl Quintanilla with John Ford and Mike Santoli here at Post 9 of the New York Stock Exchange. Joining us this morning from Palo Alto, Foundation Capital General Partner Paul Holland. Paul, it's good to have you back. Let's talk some Netflix morning. this morning. Uh, off the highs today, but the streaming giant hits another record high today. The company adds 5.3 million subs in Q3, promises an $8 billion bet on original content next year. Paul, the last time you were with us, you called the company, quote, pure heroin when compared to its competitors for its subservice. It's worth noting that Foundation Capital was an early investor and you've worked closely with Reed Hastings. Now we're in this chapter, Paul, where we're, we're watching the U.S. profitable and the playbook being expanded uh, international, where uh, that's increasingly where the story is, right? That's correct. Yeah. If you recall, uh, a couple of years ago, we had this conversation before they had any significant presence in international. And I think uh, there were really three things going on. We saw a beat in terms of the subscriber base. Uh, we saw rapid expansion internationally, and we saw a continued uh, pressing of the bet on original content. And so far, all three of those things are playing out very well for Netflix. Paul, I guess if you believe the long-term Netflix story, you believe that this company is possibly the best in the world at matching the right piece of content, you know, making it discoverable to the right user, and thus deploying what's going to be this $8 billion in exactly the right way. Is, is that how you see it? Is efficiency being the story here longer term? Uh, I think efficiency is certainly part of it, but I, when every time I've looked at the, what the Netflix management team has done, when they choose between short-term expediency and sticking to the long-term strategy, they always go with the latter. And when I look at something like original content, uh, my wife and I, uh, Lindy Yates, watched uh, Mindhunter last night. A brand new show, a David Fincher show on Netflix, absolutely fantastic. But what's great about it is, is that it's effectively a police drama. It's a very tired genre on traditional TV. But what they've done is create this incredible beauty and this artistry with the uh, period pieces from 1977 in Virginia, my junior year in high school, with my friends at Prince George High School. But also just the cars, the airplanes, the art, the music the fashion, all the things that they did with that, the attention to detail. It's like Oscar level, level movies, but it's in our nightly TV stream. Paul, how do you think Netflix these days thinks about where the product is going to sit in the entire array uh, of competition for kind of customer eyeballs? Uh, obviously, we've gotten p past the idea that it's somehow either Netflix or a cable package or only one streaming app. But does Netflix just want to be kind of, a, you know, the first choice indispensable for everybody? Or do they feel like they have to displace the others in an active way? Well, I think they probably went through a, an element of their history where they were in the, the mode of displacement, certainly, because they, you know, they had to come onto the market where traditional TV was 100% of the marketplace. But now, as you know, what we're seeing is we're going from this notion of cord cutters, so people of my generation or, or, or slightly younger who are getting off of cable as a platform, to my children's generation, which are called cord nevers. And so this cord never generation, as they're coming up now, really all they watch are Netflix and other streaming shows. They really don't have any relationship to terrestrial television. Paul, now we're in this picture where we're going through the candidates of other competitors who could feasibly offer services on, at this scale uh, to threaten Netflix, uh, or at least threaten their market share. Uh, it was suggested by RBC in our last hour that Amazon could do it, right? They could do a standalone uh, $7 a month service, X Prime, uh, but unlikely because they want to protect Prime. So who does that leave? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question, although uh, I, I certainly know the Netflix management well enough to know that they're paranoid and they're looking around every corner in terms of where people could come from with new content. But I think Amazon over the years has been a formidable competitor. But it just feels to me like over the last few quarters, Netflix has really begun to separate there. And I think part of that is, of course, they've taken the lead. They've really pressed the bet on this original content. Uh, and they're putting incredible pressure on all of their competitors across the board to the point that we're seeing some of the traditional competitors really begin to capitulate. And so I think it's going to get down to just a handful of people who have either the will or the financial resources to continue to compete. And certainly Amazon, I expect to be in this market for a long, long time. Uh, quickly, uh, Paul, I'm wondering what 
opportunities does this Netflix phenomenon create beyond, obviously, the bonanza among content creators in Hollywood? I mean, Jeffrey Katzenberg's trying to raise $2 billion to, to reinvent, um, you know, short form content. But what other things are you looking for as an investor you're looking to fund that Netflix has paved the way for? Well, I think uh, the, the whole media category is a, is a very um, uh, tenuous category for folks in the venture capital industry. And you guys are in media. You know all about the pitfalls associated with it. Obviously, we've been very, very fortunate. We've gotten the best play uh, that there's been in the last 25 years in media with Netflix. So we certainly monitor what we see in other places. We see some other subscriber-led services. There's some interesting companies that we've observed, some that appeal toward millennials, some that appeal toward people with a very heavy sports mix, whatever it might happen to be. But these subscription-led services with high retention, high engagement, those are places that we see uh, some, some fertile ground. And I'd also make a, a slightly orthogonal content, I, comment. I don't think it's something we'd invest in, but I think what Netflix is going to help to see is sort of the democratization of the production of content. I think you're going to see content happening all over the world now, in part because it's just simply a focus on quality. It's, not, it's less about who you know, it's what you're creating. Paul, while we're on uh, the topic of Netflix, we are watching the Dow, which just hit 23,000 for the first time. Uh, another big milestone, uh, not too long after we crossed 22K. This is being helped yeah. in this case, Paul, by UNH. Just a monster move in that uh, Dow leader today was adding 70 points to the index earlier this morning. But I got to ask you just about the environment, this slow, slow melt up that we've had. Uh, very few days with 1% moves, even on an intraday basis. It's been six weeks since the S&Ps had an intraday 1% move. Uh, how do you characterize the environment we're in right now? Uh, for investors of the strata that we're in, in the, uh, in the venture investing realm, I'd characterize it as, as slightly dangerous. Uh, we just got together a group that we formed called the Foundation Capital Fellows. It's graduate students from all across the country, from MIT and Harvard and Stanford, Berkeley, Chicago, and other places. And they were asking that question, you know, from the historical perspective, for me, 34 years out here, uh, in the high-tech industry. And what we're seeing now is we're going into our 10th year of a bull market, which is uh, close to unprecedented even in my lifetime, the kind of things that I've seen. So I think this is one where you got to be very, very careful, at least at the stage of investing where we are. At, at the level that you guys cover in terms of public market investing, the only mistake you could have made over the last few years is just being out of the market. Santola, your thoughts? Uh, you know, it's, it's the grind. I mean, that's what really stands out is just how quiet it is, um, really how little uh, obvious energy or enthusiasm is behind it. It's just about the world repricing stocks. The Dow, the clear winner also, by the way, over the last year. It's been the kind of stocks that have worked uh, in this reflation environment, global and all the rest. But the other thing that stands out to me about 23,000, even though it's only 4.5% above 22,000, is that if you go back to the, the 2000, the year 2000 high, 11.5 was basically the cap. It spent a few days above that level, so you've doubled off the 2,000 high, which is kind of uh, interesting as a historical note, which also is outperforming what the S&P has done since that point. Mike, if you're mom and pop at home, how do you rebalance in this kind of environment where, you know, if you were just taking the straight ahead of advice of mainly being basically in the S&P 500, you're looking at your performance over the past year, and you're up like 20%. Yeah. What, what do you do? I mean, you don't you don't want to necessarily get out of the market entirely, but you also want to kind of be cautious. If you're rebalancing in the true sense of the word, and it probably is uncomfortable, you're, you're trimming back on stocks and you're putting it into bonds or something like that. And I think that's what people, what frustrates people is that it doesn't seem like that feels right. But what does a go trim into bonds feel like when everybody when expects? When you've been up 20% to, in a year, how do you... You bring it. You bring it back to what your <laughs> your mix is supposed to be, uh, I guess. But what's what's most interesting is it's kind of the everything melt up. It's not just U.S. stocks. Uh, absolutely, uh, the, Paul. This morning, uh, Bank of America has their manager survey. Cash levels go to four seven, uh, which is the lowest since 2015. They argue that a a, a drop to four two is what, in their words, ends the Icarus trade. Are you, are you in this mode where you know we're late in the cycle and it's now a matter of figuring out how long the music plays? 
Well, I think anyone who's been around for more than one cycle looks at something like this and says, look, and, you know, at some point the party has to end. But let me make a, a, a different comment. Over the last few weeks, I've, 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 I've spoken at three different investor conferences, all focused around China. We have a, a significant investor in our fund, Peakview Capital, and uh, I've joined them on some of these panels. And, and let me just give you an idea of what's going on, because what's driving both the growth in our industry, where we're being exposed to new investors that, that frankly, we've never heard of, who are, are, are showing up with seven, eight, nine, ten billion dollars worth of capital. And what we're seeing in the stock market, in the U.S. stock market, is where are the alternatives? I mean, the world is getting richer. I know that there's a there's a dialogue coming out of uh, out of, out of the White House that that you know the world's kind of like going to gloom and doom. But just the trend line on all these other things is just the exact opposite. China's getting wealthier. India is getting wealthier. The developing world is getting wealthier in fits and starts. That money all ends up going into some equivalent of pension funding, savings, whatever it might happen to be. It's all seeking alpha and it's seeking beta. And at the end of the day, what you're seeing now that's driving this and also the growth in our industry and private equity and others is just the world is becoming wealthier and that money is looking for a return somewhere. And at the moment, it's finding a terrific home in the U.S. stock market.